Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 375. Don't give me any money, don't give me any people, but give me freedom, and I'll give you a movie that looks gigantic. Robert Rodriguez. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films. From predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them, the odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur Method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's film, B-I-Z, book.com. Today's show is also sponsored by the Make Your Movie Boot Camp. You want to make a feature film but have no idea where to begin. I feel you because that's exactly where I was when I first got started, but I finally decided to stop talking about making a movie and go out and just do it. After working in the business for over 25 years and working with some of the biggest clients and stars in Hollywood, I decided to finally make my first micro-budget feature film that was self-distributed, sold around the world, and I even got a streaming deal from Hulu. It took me years of hard work to learn from my mistakes and to get where I am today. I want to help filmmakers break through their own fears and show them the secret sauce on how to make a profitable film. The Make Your Movie Bootcamp is a two-day intensive covering on day one micro-budget filmmaking and on day two the film entrepreneur method where you learn how to create revenue from your feature films. We cover everything from flushing out your idea, the screenwriting process, finding money, crowdfunding, directing your film, post-production workflows, marketing, film deliverables, self-distribution secrets, and how not to get ripped off by predatory film distributors. The boot camp takes place March 28th and 29th in Burbank, California, and spaces are limited, so act now. Head over to mymbootcamp.com. That's mymbootcamp.com. Now, guys, before we get started, uh, as you notice, last week we had episode number 375, and this week we have episode number 375, because last week I had to take down episode 375, the original one, which was my interview with Neil Ames, an ex distributor employee, where he kind of talked all about what happened on the inside from his point of view. And unfortunately, he had signed an non-disclosure agreement or an NDA that he had forgotten about and was informed that he needed to get this pulled down immediately. So I was requested to do so and did it. And uh, whoever did listen to the episode, I hope you enjoyed it, but it is now off. But I didn't want to give up my 375. That's a really significant podcast number. So I was like, no, you know what? I'm just going to do a reboot. So today... We have an awesome guest to celebrate our 375th episode, Josh Stifter. And Josh is a writer-director and was featured on the show Rebel Without a Crew, the series, on El Rey Network. Now, many of you know that Robert Rodriguez owns El Rey Network, and his the series is actually based off of his book, Rebel Without a Crew, the legendary independent film book on his exploits when he was coming up with El Mariachi. And Robert decided to put together a show to have filmmakers use his techniques and methods on the El Mariachi style of making movies and giving filmmakers 14 days and $7,000 to make their feature film. And Josh was one of those filmmakers, and he made the movie The Good Exorcist which obviously it's a romantic comedy. No, I'm joking. Uh, but it was I loved the movie. I thought it was so much fun to watch. And it premiered at the South by Southwest Film Festival. 
And I wanted to talk shop with Josh about how he did it, how he used his visual effects skills, his practical effects skills on set, kind of the crazy stories of what happened behind the scenes of the show, what it was like to work with Robert Rodriguez, talk to him, have him as a mentor during this process, which is, I think is a dream of many independent filmmakers out there. And I was so impressed by the movie and the making of the movie that I'm now offering it on Indie Film Hustle TV. So Josh allowed me to put it up on IFH TV and you will be able to get exclusive content like the director's commentary of how he made it, including behind the scenes tutorials and all that is available on IFH TV. All you got to do is go to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Good Exorcist. But before you watch the movie, you've got to listen to this epic episode. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Josh Stifter. I'd like to welcome to the show Josh Stifter, man. How you doing, brother? Dude, I'm doing great. I'm so excited to be on the show. Oh, man. It was, I mean, it's the least I could do. You had me on your show, your amazing show. So I appreciate uh, I appreciate you coming on, man. And um, we, uh, I've been wanting to talk to you a little bit about, uh, obviously, your experience on Rebel Without a Crew and yeah. – all these other cool things that you've been doing as well. You're a unique filmmaker and the way you do things. So we're going to get into all of that. But first, man, how did you get into the business? Yeah, so this is kind of crazy. So I, I was like a big film geek as a kid, like we all, all of us filmmakers are. But it came down to like, I love to steal my dad's camera and run around with it. So I've been making little movies with my friends since I was younger than six, five. I don't even know when I first grabbed the camera and dad was like, <laughs> bring it back. Um, but it was always a challenge of finding friends to work with, finding the right equipment to make it look like a real movie. So I ended up going into animation. I took the Tim Burton route. Um, and I just thought, you know, if I can learn to draw pictures, and at the time South Park was huge. So mm -hmm. I was kind of just aping that cell park style and stealing like what they did and trying to do my own little cutout things and whatever, you know, kids getting hit by cars or whatever gross thing I could do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, from there, I, after I graduated a whole bunch of shorts in high school and stuff like that. And then I went to animation school and they push, they push kids towards 3d right now. It's mm -hmm. all about video game design. Cause there's so much work in video games. Right. And it just wasn't for me. I graduated with a degree in animation, but all of the jobs that they were trying to place me in were video game design. Mm -hmm. Just did nothing for me. I can't tell stories in video games as an animator. Like there's other people telling those stories. So what I did was I just hit the internet. I started sending things up via Twitter. The early days of Twitter and Facebook, there was no Instagram at the time. You know, there's probably still a MySpace at that point. And I just started sending it to anyone who I respected in the industry and Kevin Smith picked up my animations and dug them. And I started working for Kevin Smith, like right out of college. That's that, that, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's it, it all awesome. boils down to just putting myself out there and not being afraid that what I made wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. Cause it wasn't, it wasn't great. It was it, like, if I look at it now, I'm like, Oh my God, how did Kevin Smith pick up this garbage? Uh -huh. But I think there was just something about the, the drive that I had to just show it. And then he was able to like, go, okay, I can do something with this. I can figure something out. And I did some automations for a while. Then I worked on his movie Tusk. Um, I did like four animations all, all together for Tusk. I helped out with some website stuff and just a bunch of random projects. And after that was on my resume, then I was able to get jobs working for other animation companies. I worked for CNN. I worked for Troma. I, I, and that, is how I got the animation done that ended up getting getting me in front of Robert Rodriguez. Yeah, so that was the so yeah. How did you get you know how did you get involved with whole Rebel Without a Crew? And explain to people who have not heard of the other episodes I've done on Rebel Without a Crew. What is Rebel Without a Crew? What was the whole thing? Yeah, so I always wanted to be a filmmaker, not an animator. Like that was never my plan. It was just the only thing I could do by myself that I could get out there to people and seemed monetizable. Mm -hmm. You know, filmmaking it's awesome. Great to tell stories, but I mean, you've done hundreds of episodes on distribution alone. Like, it's not an easy game. You mm -hmm. gotta hustle your ass off. And I, I struggled to figure out how I could make something that would be good enough to show to people, and also, um, and also monetizable that I would make money off of. Because I knew my little no budget movies weren't going to get distribution right off the bat. So I, I did animation for that. 
And but I, I was a filmmaker at heart. I wanted to tell stories. And Robert's book, Rebel Without a Crew, was my Bible. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Well, every most of the people listening to this have probably read the book, but if you haven't, just read it oh, every God, yes. day. Just, mm-hmm. just read it. I, I it it really is like my Bible. I've gone through four copies. Like my grandma went through the Bible. Like I just constantly, I'll flip to pages at night before bed. And I'm like, I need some inspiration. Tell me something, Robert, and read it. So I, uh, I did an animation with my buddy, Josh Roush. It was this weird little art house animation called Other Fish. It's available on YouTube and a bunch of other stuff. But Josh Roush was assistant to Michael Parks on Tusk. And he asked Michael to do a voiceover for the animation or for this animation. And he, we barely knew each other at the time, but he got this voiceover and uh, Josh and I started talking and we were talking about animation. He's like, man, I got this voiceover. We should do an animation with Michael Parks. So we had a couple of the voice actors come in and do their voices. And then Michael Parks passed away and we finished the animation. And then I had Michael Parks is essentially his last performance. And I felt like people needed to see that because Michael Parks was a legend. He is. And absolutely. Yeah, and I I thought of Robert, and I you know I, we showed it to Kevin, and we showed it to people who had worked with Michael, um, but the only way I could get it to Robert was through El Rey Network, and so I just I sent it to El Rey Network, and they were like, hey, we really enjoy this, but it doesn't fit on our programming at all. But we're running the show called The People's Network, where we're going to show short films, um, and we saw your Tim the Terrible animation as well. Can we use that? We'll buy it from you for a year and we'll put it on our network. We'll fly you out to L.A. and you'll come on the show and do a little introduction or whatever. And then, you know, you'll, you'll be a part of this people's network thing that Robert wants to do. So I flew out to L.A. And while I was there sitting and waiting, I opened my backpack because they wanted me to put on a different shirt. I was wearing some death metal shirt or some shit like that. So they wanted me to put on a different shirt. And while I opened my backpack, they saw that I had like two copies of Rebel Without a Crew. And they're like whoa, you are dedicated to it. I'm like, oh my God, I am so dedicated to it. You guys don't even know. I, this is not a rare thing for me to have this book in my bag. I'm not doing this because I'm here for Robert or because this is Robert's network. I, I've always got this with me. And the, the showrunner of that show was like, well, we're working on this other show called Rebel Without a Crew. Have you ever done any live action stuff? I have, but it's all like shorts with my buddies and stuff like that, or literally shorts I've done by myself. I've done a whole bunch of shorts where I set up cameras on rigs with mm-hmm. uh, tripods with wheels and I use fishing line to make the camera move and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So I showed it to them and they're like, oh, we got to get this to Robert. So they sent it and they, they sent my little pitch that I put together. I literally sent this pitch that I put together on the bus going to work. Like I, I did my three X structure of the good exorcist. I put down a couple scenes and a couple characters and I snapped a photo of a bunch of random items I had laying around my house. Um, and I put it on this little table, this little artsy table that my wife has. I put it on there, snapped a picture, made a quick logo. That poster was the poster that still got used for El Rey Network. The logo is still the logo for The Good Exorcist. Like every, And the outline still plays pretty close to what the movie turned out being. But uh, yeah, they, then they just asked me to send a script. And Rebel Without a Crew was a series that was based on that book where Robert hired or hired, had four, had me and four other filmmakers come out and make a feature film for seven thousand dollars and shot in 14 days and then we had like two and a half three months to edit do visual effects do sound design do everything nice and then you were in part you were part of that uh yep i was one of the four filmmakers and i made a feature called the good exorcist a silly little horror comedy that you know i i went into it going like i have to go on reality tv this is probably going to be miserable I am not a reality TV guy. I'm a, I'm a dad from Minnesota. Like, I do not fit the mold of reality TV. Right. And I know they're going to be, like, trying to work in these stories for me, and there's going to be a script. There really wasn't a script at all. I was blown away. This was not. This was way more like a docu-series than a reality show. Yeah, so um, I, the, thing, the thing I love about the show, um, because there was someone who sent me a link to it. I'm not going to say who. But there was a, someone who sent me a link to the show. A really, a really like handsome, smart man. Um, yeah, with maybe glasses and a goatee. But I actually <laughs> watched the entire thing. I, I, I just binged it because I had been dying to watch it and I didn't get El Rey at the time. And I watched the entire 
series. Like, I mean, literally, I was like between. I I knocked the whole thing out in a day. Like, I was you like, did. A day. I remember you messaged me. I was like, I'm done. This is amazing because I was so addicted to it, and and knowing some of the players, knowing you and knowing uh, Alejandro, um, in it as well, was was fascinating to watch. Then I called you up. I'm like, so really, what happened here? And really, what happened here? And, and I called oh, yeah. him too. Like, so what was the thing that happened here? But what I love about the sh- the show, honestly, is because I was a part of uh, the process of Project Greenlight. I made it into season two, just in the opening credits. It's a very, very horrible uh, experience. But I did. I go. I went through Pro- Project Greenlight, and then I also got to the very end of the Steven Spielberg reality show called On the Lot. Oh yeah, you did. I didn't know that. I, I was, watched it. Uh, my buddy Andy Hunt was on it. Yeah, well, I got to the. I was. I was in the final. I was one of the final guys that you know they. You know, I flew in and I did the interviews and everything like that. So, uh, and that was. So I had always. I've always that. You know, kind of like passed by the reality show thing. I would have killed to be on something like this back in the day. But what I loved about it, it was there was no drama. There, I mean, there was a little drama because it, it's filmmaking. But it there was, was real no drama for the most part. Yeah, it was not. Pers- it wasn't like designed or like, oh, I'm gonna backstab you or this or that. You no. know, there was a li- there was a little bit of storytelling, but generally speaking, it is a as a love letter to filmmakers. It was a wonderfully, wonderfully put together show, and you guys were awesome. And you could just see the just stress. On your faces. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's funny because like some of the things that like the, the the things that are shown aren't maybe necessarily exactly how it played out. It's still reality TV. They're of still course. like coming up with concepts. I thought it was really funny that my sort of story element was Josh's cast is having too much fun and he's getting mad about all the fun that they're having, which is like, OK, I don't that's not really how it went down. There was like a split second where I'm like, you guys, we got to go to lunch in five minutes because of union rules. So let's just get this knocked out of the park. But there was no like face that I'm making where I'm like, that was just a random face. I made. Yes. Because, Um, because the film is called the good exorcist, but yet we can't have any fun. So it it doesn't really play, but generally speaking, it was a very well put together show. And, um, Oh my God. And I still love it. I love when people watch it because I think it's a blast to watch. I mean, it is a love letter to that indie process of just running and gunning and getting shit done. And it's so fun because when you watch it and like when Robert shows up, it's literally like God. Like, you know, it's like, it's like a, a, a God from Mount Hollywood, uh, indie, indie Hollywood, if you will, shows up and it's like, he's so chilled. He's so mellow. He's, cause he's seen it all. He's been through it all. And he was, he really cares. At least, at least that's the perception that we got. I got from watching it that there was, oh, just, yeah. he cares about you guys and cared about the process. And um, anybody who's listened to the show knows that I'm a, I'm a fairly big Robert Rodriguez fan. Um, and, um, I'm a bit older than you. So I was around, uh, what, how old are you? So oh, 34. Yeah. Something so I'm, like yeah, so I'm, let's just say I'm a little bit older. Than, let's say that I was around when mariachi hit. Sure. I have I have the first edition of Rebel Without a Crew, uh, and I and I studied Robert constantly. I even mentioned him in my book, uh, the Shooting for the Mob book. I actually do a whole Robert Rodriguez story of how I called him when he was at Columbia, nice <laughs> at, at the Columbia at, at Columbia Pictures. So and pitched Love and it. pitched and pitched myself as a I'll do anything for you. But anyway, that's an embarrassing story. But uh, I'm a huge Robert fan, so just watching that and. And watching how you guys interacted with him was just so and you know, cool. He was a guru in as much, and he still is. Like, and he's the thing about Robert is he really is like the sweetest dude in the world, and really cares about filmmaking and indie filmmaking and trying things and just going for it. He doesn't want to play it safe ever, and he pushed that on us. Like, don't play it safe. Go for it. Go for it. Um, but I do love the scene where he comes into my my set as I'm shooting. And you can just see on my face where I'm like, oh, man, I'm really trying to get done today. <laughs> like, like, I can't. I, I love you, Robert. It's, but I just can't. I don't have the time for this right now. I know. <laughs> I love it and I hate it. And you can hear in my I, – someday I'll release this. But in my footage as I'm filming, I go, I guess we'll cut. And then under my breath, you hear me just go, why fucking now? <laughs> 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 and it's just I wanted to hang out with Robert. I love talking to Robert. One of the one of the beautiful things about the behind this or the one thing I can say about the behind the scenes that you don't see on the show is um, Robert is a film geek and he and I would sit and talk about like the nerdiest stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh they they had an 
they were running a drone on an A60 or with an A6300, which is what I shot my second feature, Greywood's plot with, and or 6500, whatever the Sony with the amazing, you know, the the amazing uh, autofocus, mm-hmm. so that on the drone it just looked amazing. And Robert asked what it was, and I was like, oh, oh, I know, I know, I know, and I just like went on this tangent about the A6300 and how I used it to film Greywood's plot and all this other stuff. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Which I had started filming before we went to Rebel Without a Crew, failed miserably at. And then as soon as Rebel Without a Crew ended, the first thing I said to Daniel was, dude, we, we've got it. And he goes, yeah, I know. We got to finish Greywood's plot. And we, right as soon as Good Exorcist came out, we were waiting for it to get the rights back and waiting for everything to go down. We just went and made another movie for $2,000. Yeah, so so that and then for everybody listening, he made his movie The Good Exorcist for seven grand, which I was the part that, that was the part of the show because Robert Rodriguez, you know, legendarily or, or almost a mythology, it's a myth at this point. It's like mythology. Um, he's like uh, what's his name, Bunyan, the guy who cut down cut down trees. I mean, yeah. he's become a mythical uh, person. Um, he made his Fumi El Mariachi with seven thousand. That's what the show is based around. So, what did you learn? from making a $7,000 feature film. And it was a true $7,000 feature. It wasn't like, oh, and they kind of helped you here and they kind of helped you there. There were rules to this engagement, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yeah, so we had a credit card with $7,000 on it. Like, we could only spend that much. Now, I will say that the $7,000 now is very different than when Robert did it, and it's very mm-hmm. different than what we have for equipment now, what you can do with oh. very little. And and the the world that has opened up to independent filmmaking for better or worse, where there is so much independent filmmaking that you have to be a little more um, conscious about who your audience is, you know, making a $7,000 movie. Now people will instantly go like, okay, so you didn't have a budget. Who cares? You know what I mean? Like it can be a challenge. Now what impresses people is when you show them something and you go, I always have my trailer on my phone so I can go check this out. I made this for $7,000. I made this for $2,000 because they see the trailer and they go, Oh, I'd watch that. That's, you made that for $7,000. That trailer cost you $7,000. I'm not a movie cost me $7,000. Um, so what, one of the big things I learned is number one, no, no one cares that it's $7,000 until they care at $7,000. So until they (laughs) see it and go, how did you do that for $7,000? They don't, they don't know. They don't care. Budgets mean nothing. So, so trying to sell your movie on the budget means nothing until you get eyes on it. It's a great story for your Q&A afterwards. It's a great thing to build towards, but it isn't your sales pitch. Your sales pitch is, I made this kick-ass thing. Now, that's what Robert did back in the day. It's not really any different. Robert didn't go to the studios and go, when he was going door-to-door in Hollywood over Christmas, and go, hey, I made a $7,000 movie. Do you want to buy it? He went there and he told them he made a $30,000 movie or a $20,000 movie. He tested the waters. He showed them his trailer. And hope in hopes of getting more money for his next movie it's the same thing now yeah it's a whole it's a whole different world when he did it uh, no one had ever done anything like that at least and they actually used that seven thousand dollar price tag as the marketing campaign back in 91 because in 91 studios did. the studio did not robert no because in, yeah. no, nobody would show up to a studio meeting go i made my movie for seven thousand he would say i made a movie for fifty thousand i made yeah. the movie for sixty thousand which is still an obscene number back in 1991 because he was shot on film and everything. But then later the studio's like, wait a minute, we've got something here. And they marketed it as a $7,000 film. Um, and nowadays a lot of filmmakers, I talk to them all the time. They're like, hey, we shot on an iPhone. I'm like, I don't care. Hey, we yeah. shot this movie, you know, for three grand. Don't care. Like it's not a, no one cares. It only, no. they only care once they care, which means they have exactly. to watch it and they go, wait a minute, you made this for, se-. now all of a sudden it means something. But to lead with that, like, you know, there's filmmakers that I'm like, oh, we shot a movie in two days. No one cares. I've shot, right. like, I, I know somebody who shot a movie in, in 90 minutes. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's all about the story. But back then, different conversation. You could use that as a marketing ploy. Yeah. And, and seven grand, he spent like six grand, a little over six grand on film stock. Like, in the actual movie, it, he says he put the key tells this to like I was just talking to him the other day because he saw Grey Woods and was talking about the fact that he was impressed it was done for two thousand dollars or whatever. I mean, he asked and then I told him a bo- it's a bogus number. I have no idea. 
because I did the editing, I did the directing, I ran the camera, I did the visual effects. There's a visual effect in almost every single shot of the movie. Okay, if I paid myself, this is a $300,000 movie, but I'm not paying myself. Same here. So that, that number is just a bogus number because I would never do that for someone else's movie. I'd make mm-hmm. them pay me for their movie. So if I really want to boil down the budget, I don't, I don't count my computer, but on a normal budget, you would count the computers that you bought for said film. There's all of this or stuff that gear goes the and stuff like that. Yeah, of course. I own all the gear. It's all stuff that I bought over the last 20 years of filmmaking and, you know, upgraded as I went and whatever. But I just, you, you don't count that unless you're in a, you know, but in a Hollywood film, like in a big production, they count all of that. They rent it all or they buy it all. The studio has, studio has it all, but it all goes towards the budget. So the big thing that I learned from, like the biggest thing I learned was just shut up about the budget. No one cares. Make a good movie and show them your good movie. And the other thing I learned is there is no such thing as a good movie or a bad movie. There is just a movie and you need to put yourself on the screen and get it to the right people because the right people will care about it. And every movie is someone's favorite movie and the le- and their, and someone else's least favorite movie. So sitting and pontificating about how you're going to make your masterpiece as your full first movie, just quit it. Just go make a couple movies, figure it out and find your audience. That's going to dig it. Yeah, no, there's there's no question about it. Like, I, anytime I ever got a negative review, I would always just go and and look up um, a Star Wars, <clears throat> a Star Wars negative review, or a Shawshank Redemption negative review, or a Godfather negative review, because <clears throat> there were people love- people that wrote bad reviews, and you read them, and you're just like, oh my, like, re- go just type in anyone listening right now, go into Google, type in Shawshank Redemption bad review. <laughs> They're <laughs> hilarious to read. They're just epically hilarious to read. I, I remember I saw a picture with George Lucas. He had a t-shirt with his bad review on the t-shirt. It was like this long block of text about how bad Star Wars was. I was like, that's meta. That's so awesome. Yeah, man, the Thing was panned by most critics when it dropped. The movie tanked. I think The Thing might be the only like flawless movie that I wouldn't change a single frame of, wouldn't add a minute, wouldn't cut a minute. It's a perfect horror uh, psychological thriller in my book. And like that movie got panned when it came out. Some of the reviews are hilarious. And with, especially with indie filmmaking, you're definitely going to split the audience. You're, you're, you're making something that is intentionally not made for everyone. If you're making a movie that's for everyone as an indie, no budget filmmaker, you are doing it totally wrong and you are going to fail. You need to find your market Niche. and figure out and, and figure out who you who you are as a person and what kind of films you can do that are different than anyone else that are going to build that audience. And you're just going to improve. Treat it like film school. Treat your first movie like a learning experience. They'll make, make the best thing you can make. Don't go out and try to make a piece of crap. One of the things Daniel and I really push. Daniel was on the good uh, on the Good Exorcist set with me. We were allowed to bring one person. He's the he's group. the giant man next to you. He is a very, very tall he's a man. Large he's a very short man, and he is a very tall man. I'm not a short man, but I'm still not as tall as he is. He is a giant. He's a big he, man. And he, he, we've always been like this. So I am. It's great I'm, watching I'm, you two. It's great watching you two together. It's just funny as hell. <laughs> I'm five four on a tall day, and Daniel is six seven. So the two of us are. He's he's a feet over me, six 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 seven, something like that. He just towers over me. And that's honestly, that's one of the like things. So our friendship is based. We became friends in kindergarten, literally the same year, literally the same year that Robert made El Mariachi. Daniel and I were meeting in kindergarten. I kid you not. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, I was in high school. Oh, God, I'm so old. (laughs) Okay, go ahead. Sorry. So, yeah, Daniel and I were in kindergarten meeting and. Robert was filming that, and then 25 years later, we were out making a movie with Robert Rodriguez. Isn't that mind-blowing? It is but, ridiculous. And uh, so uh, Daniel came out with me as my plus one, even though technically he wasn't a plus one, because he was an actor, and we could have actors work on our set as well. And he's in every scene of the movie except for one, and he even whistles in that scene. So he's in every scene of the movie, basically. Um, and one of the reasons why I think we we became such good friends and continued to be friends as we both loved filmmaking, but he was so tall and I was so small. He always just looked epic in every shot I filmed him in. Cause I was always getting that badass low angle. <laughs> and that's not by design. That's just by necessity. It was necessity. <laughs> right. 
In fact, in The Good Exorcist, there's a scene where the priest gets sent to hell, and I wanted Daniel to, number one, we filmed it on Troublemaker Studio at the same spot where they filmed Planet Terror. I wanted Daniel to be kneeling in hell in the same spot that Bruce Willis stood. Now, I removed everything from the shot. Like, I digitally changed everything, so you would never know that. But I just thought that would be a cool story to have Daniel be kneeling in hell where Bruce Willis stood for Planet Terror. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now, back to the show. And then on top of that, one of the reasons I wanted him to be kneeling in hell was in the hopes that I could finally fil- film him from a tall angle, from like my normal angle, and get a shot of him. And I could not. I had to stand on a bunch of chairs and get the tripod up all high up. He's that tall that he was kneeling, and I still couldn't get a low angle or a high angle down on him. So I wanna, I'm going to geek out here for a second because there's been a lot of talk about Tyler Perry's uh, amazing – uh, sound, you know, facility, sound stages, production, uh, epic mecca that he's built in Georgia. <clears throat> but uh, talk to us a little bit about Troublemaker Studios because that oh was kind God. of like the first indie. You know, he, he like again, we, and I'll t- I'll say it again. Robert's a god, and you know, he's, he's a mythical guy, and what he was able to do with creating what he's created over in Austin is pretty mind blowing. So can oh you tell, can you tell us a little bit about what Troublemaker Studios is like and, and how it's worked in with El Rey and everything? I just want you to tell the story because I really want filmmakers to understand that it is, it's a possibility. You can take your, your, your stuff to the next level. You can. So here's, that was one of the things I wanted to bring up is you can dream big, like legitimately, I, I have no dreams or uh, the kind of filmmaker I am, a $250 million movie doesn't sound fun to me to be a part of. That sounds really, 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 really really hard and a lot of pressure. Sitting on the Alita set, editing my $7,000 movie in a $7 million like area. So this, this like section of the Alita set costs $7 million. I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but I'm going to anyway. Sure. I snuck onto it a few times with a director's chair and would edit my movie on the Alita set, even though I wasn't supposed to be back there. Because I thought it would be cool to have this memory of making a $7,000 movie on a $7 million set. Mm-hmm. Um, but what Robert has is, it's, it's an old airport. You can look this up. You can yeah. see it on Google Maps or whatever. It's this big airport that he's turned into a giant green screen. He has all the studio space. He's got everything there. He makes his movies there. They shot Predators there. If you look at the behind the scenes on Predators, you can see Predators. Yeah, that's what it's called, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Predators. Yeah, yeah, it's called Predators. Yeah, okay. And they, they, they set up, instead of filming, you know, in the rainforest, they created a rainforest in his back lot. And there was still pieces of it while we were there. In fact, I was hoping to get that lot for Predators in the, background of the good exorcist but it was just too far away and too dark um they filmed planet terror sequences there they film the green screen is where they filmed all of sin city uh alita you know has they had the big sound stage there for alita and you can actually go and watch a behind the scenes i think it's on might be on l ray's youtube page or maybe robert's youtube page it's on someone's youtube page but there's this really really great behind the scenes that steve joiner put together steve joiner is like robert's He's his prop maker, but he's also just I never felt even talking to Robert, you know, I talked to Kevin Smith. I talked to Robert. I never felt like I was in the presence of someone that was bigger than me, like not not like everyone's bigger than me, but like that was doing things more important. I always feel like we're all just kind of filmmakers doing film stuff. There's a moment where I was talking to Steve Joyner in his office while making uh, The Good Exorcist, and I was holding a and talking about how you I'm sorry you were holding what you you broke up for a second you were holding what a Hattori Hanzo sword <laughs> nice. from Kill Bill literally holding a Hattori, a Hattori Hanzo sword because because Joiner made them mm-hmm. so I'm holding one they're all over at the Troublemaker Studio holding one of those eating a salad while Steve Joiner is telling me how they used methyl cellulose in the Alien movies and how I could use that on my monsters. And I was like, this is 
the most insane. I'm in presence of someone who has done things that I have never dreamt of. Like it was just a crazy moment. Um, but that's the kind of stuff at Troublemaker Studios are the Steve Joiners, the the people that you just are like, oh my God, Robert surrounds himself with the masters, like the best people in the world who can do things where you're just like Nina Proctor, who is the uh, his costume designer. Um, she was in the show. She's the one who kind of walked us through wardrobe. And folks, the one, the other thing you'll learn is when you go in to make a feature film and you're under pressure to make a feature film, there are things that you do not know and you will rely on anyone who can help you in any way. I do not know wardrobe at all. <laughs> I literally wrote the movie, The Good Exorcist, because I could put my best friend in a priest costume and he'd never have to change. I have wardrobe every day. It'll end up stinking after two weeks, but I don't have to change him out of it at all. And Nina helped me through all the other characters and what they could wear. Um, and I relied on the the actors. They'll, they will read the script. They'll figure out what their character would wear better than I could because I just did not have the time or the patience to sit down and go, like, what shoes would Stanley wear? And Avery figured it out and showed up to set. Stanley is kind of a goofball in the movie. Showed up to set one day with one pant leg rolled up. And I was like, that's funny. Why are you, Why do you have one pant leg rolled up thinking he was just going like, I don't know. I figured a character in Dumb and Dumber would do it. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, here's the thing. I figure Stanley works on a ranch, okay? He'd probably ride like a little motorized bike around the ranch to get around. So he'd roll up his pant leg and then he'd have it up so it wouldn't get caught in the chain, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no one is ever going to get that, Avery. No one is ever going to think about that. And he's like, I know it just looks stupid, but at least we have an excuse for why I would look stupid when I wear this. I'm like, dude, dead on. Go you for do, it. You do you, man. You do you. Exactly. I did that. And it looks awesome. I've only had one person ever watch the movie and go like, why was his pant leg rolled up? But it, that one person caught it and then thought it was funny when I told the story. Now, um, you made your first. You made the good exercise for seven thousand, but now you've decided to go down in budget on your next films. Why, yeah. why is that? Because most people go up. I'm a proponent of going down. My second film, I went down. Um, I love doing that. I think you give more control and all those other things. But I'm curious why you did. So, and it wasn't like we ever thought about it. So we again, we wrote around what we had. And most of my budget for The Good Exorcist went to paying my cast. It went to – I paid my cast enough for gas and for dinner every day. Like just enough to make, make them it go. worth coming – yeah, make it worth coming out. Like for real, I didn't want them to go go away with nothing. So I think I paid everyone – everyone who was like not more than a day player, I paid a couple hundred dollars, you know, just something. And then day players, I'd give $50. Um, and – and then they'd get lunch while they were there as well. I didn't give anything to Daniel. Daniel got nothing because he's a friend. Friends work for free. That's not true. At the end, I had four hundred extra dollars, and I gave Daniel four hundred extra dollars. That's why my budget says seven thousand dollars. But I was like, dude, flew himself out. He came yeah. out, left his newborn boys. He had two newborn twins at the time. They were like three months old. He left for three weeks to come to Austin to help me on my silly movie. Um. So I paid them. We had to rent our camera equipment. You see that on the show. We had to rent the location. We had to pay for, uh, you know, just a bunch of things that all added up. So when it was all, I rented a slider, a $500 I, I saw slider. I saw how, how stupid. It's so stupid. But I just, in my head, I was like, I'm never going to be able to afford to rent a $500 slider. So if Robert's going to pay for it, you know what? I'm going to go for it. It was the best thing I ever did. That right. saved my movie. I, that five hundred dollars slider was used in every shot, and it made right. my movie look so much bigger budget mm -hmm. than it was because I could constantly have the camera moving. So uh, get a slider. Now, with that being said, you can get. A, I have a seventy dollars slider that I use. Or, that does you know, That works. Slider. It works totally fine. Yeah. yeah. Um. So when we came back and we went to do Greywood's plot, we just started writing around things we had, and I already had a camera. I didn't have to rent any equipment. We wrote around locations we had. We. Filmed it on the fly. Most of my budget went to getting a hotel room for a couple days. Booze. I put booze in my budget because I keep my friends happy. Sure. But I didn't pay my cast so because they were all my friends. I cast my two best friends and then a, a guy that just kind of showed up one day who was a friend of Daniel's. And then he and I became best friends. And he ended up – there's a dog man mask. There's a bunch of practical effects, a bunch of monster effects that we learned how to make ourselves. And we just learned from YouTube. And we made this mask that we were quoted – to have someone, a professional, make it. They quoted us $6,000. 
And then I got them down to like $3,000. And then I was like, what if we just do it ourselves? And it ended up costing us a couple hundred bucks to make it. And, and, it, and, it works. Work. and it works. It was a lot of work and it looks gorgeous in the movie. It's totally fun to look at and it cost us next to nothing and it works. It tells the story. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't a matter of going like, let's go down in budget. I honestly don't know what we spent when it is all said and done, because it just it was one hundred dollars here that we just two hundred dollars you know, there, five hundred bucks there. It just it's not it's not enough to take a hit. You don't you're not feeling it. In other words, it, we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. It cost as much as a vacation would have cost. Right. That's what I say. Like it cost as much as a vacation, and that's what it was. It was a vacation for me and my buddies to go in the woods, me to get down in my underwear and film a scene with my friends, <laughs> and like so, we just so, had we just had fun. So uh, one thing I I'm seeing that you that you're doing, and I'm asking certain questions very specifically because I'm leading up to this. You are you're very um, you understand who your audience is. So you're creating product for that audience. You're doing it at a, at a budget that that is doable and that is accepted for that audience. So you're basically creating an MVP or minimal viable product for your audience. So if that budget's low, great. The lower the budget, the better you're gonna chances you're gonna have of making your money back. And in the genre that you've chosen, which is kind of horror, and the, am I am I wrong? Is like it's, horror. It's genre. sort of. I'm kind of like in the comedy horror. Right. Genre. Okay. So I'm kind of like falling into this weird place of. The, the evil dead twos and stuff like that, where it's, but still horror. very, it's yeah, still it, and, you could se- and you could sell it to a horror fan all day. I can sell it. So it's fun because I can sell it to horror fans and I can sell it to people who want to get someone into horror because modern horror is very, very gory or very, very scary. And Modern horror fans like that. And that's great. I like that. I am a horror fan, but my wife isn't. So I've set out to make things that I can watch with my wife or you can watch with friends or you can put on in the background at Halloween or you can, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's light genre, but also, you know, I'm a big fan of like drag me to hell. I'm a big fan of these movies that are like, they're fun to watch. They're goofy horrors, ghostbusters. Like it's, Ghostbusters, while it is more of a comedy, has a lot of fun horror elements to it still. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I have a lot of people who watch The Good Exorcist and go like, I can't wait till my kid is 12 because this is the movie that I'm going to show them when he or she is 12. Because it's R, but it's a light R and it's a fun R. It's not too bad. Right. And then you're creating this kind of portfolio of films that you're putting under your company name and you're starting to be- build a brand. And, you know, and you've let is – that, is that fair to say? 100 percent. And part of the brand is – the down and dirty going to cons and selling my own movie directly to the audience, talking to people about it, not being afraid to talk about what it is, not being able to talk about the negatives of the film and the positives and hear people out on their opinions and have people talk about it. I make these, these first three features that I'm working on. I call them my rebel without a crew features because they're literally just taking what Robert taught in the Bible of filmmaking and putting them to practice and seeing what happens in this era, which is, it's very similar to what the Duplass brothers did in the two thousands. It's very similar to like, there's a lot of indie filmmakers that they're just finding this way to build off of it. And there are a lot of horror movies coming out right now. And they're very, very, very good. I never, I can't do that with no budget. So what I have to do is find a specific audience for that, this type of horror movie. The good exorcist is a comedy horror. It's more comedy than it is horror. It's a very watch. Greywood's plot is more of a body horror mixed with comedy, but it's still it's fun for the independent film audience to watch. It's black and white. It does weird stuff. It's the kind of movie you can watch and go, you'd never call it an art house movie, but you'd never you'd right. never go, you know, this is a blockbuster horror. Right. It, it right. fits into this weird mold of not quite David Lynchian, but not for, you know, it's not something you really want to, you know, you wouldn't show your mom this. You, you kind of, if you're a filmmaker, you'll get it more than anyone else. Um, or if you're interested in film, especially older films, it's, right. it's sort of that thing. And then Scumbag, my third movie that I literally went into production this morning on, 
is, I mean, it's, I've been in pre-production for a year now. I'm finally getting going on it, but it's a movie I'm making 100% by myself. I've set up camera rigs all over my basement so that I can have cameras on, you know, motion sliders that are like timed and stuff like that. So, and this is kind of more in the, it's more of a horror, straight up horror movie, but it's, it's still very strange. Obviously I'm making it by myself. So it's going to be strange, but it is. These three are rebel without a crew movies that I, I know my audience and my audience is the people who want passion. Yeah. And, and, and the one thing, but, and you're also, I've saw some pictures that you, I, I don't think you posted or something on Facebook where you're at the comic cons, you're at the con, the horror cons. All of them. Right. And you're, and you're selling your wares. You're selling, what are the products that you have for these, for these films other than just the films or do, or is it just the films? Uh, so I like to make stuff. I love selling T-shirts. I love selling everything because people like to be a part of the brand. They like to be in on something. And I'm not making something that is going to go out to Walmarts and Red Boxes necessarily. Now I'm going through different film distribution, many of which I owe to you, my man. You have helped me <laughs> more than any. You, you've helped me probably in post-production more way more than robert rodriguez did in post-production or in post post-production like your podcast the things you talk about like learning oh, about uh, dude it's been so helpful hearing your talks with with linda and all these other people uh it's just it's been crazy helpful Thank and you, so man. i i've been able to take that and sort of figure out what my way of selling it is and i, I realized i love marketing it but most filmmakers hate that part of the yeah. process Dude, my favorite part is sitting behind a booth and having someone going up to me and going like, dude, I love this art. What's the good exorcist? And them walking away and tweeting at me the next day. Dude, I watched the good exorcist. It was everything you said it was. Or it was, you know, I we loved it. My wife and I sat down and we cannot believe what you were able to make. That's amazing. Or the people who go on IMDb and are like, what a piece of garbage. I love that too because they just, they sat down and watched it. And I tell them, if you, you know, buy the movie, if you like it, amazing show your friends if you don't like it amazing give it to your friends like just give it away like do something with it like i don't care like just put it out in your uh, in your garage sale and sell it to someone else find a way to get it around because that's to me the fun of it is hearing what people think of it later so i didn't specifically own the rights to the good exorcist for about a year yeah I exactly because el rey did el rey did yeah, there was this weird middle ground where no one was really saying who owned it. And the paperwork was kind of fuzzy because, you know, they made the reality show, but they never really thought that much about what the movies would do when it was all said and done. That's a weird thing to make for someone else and whatever. We knew it air on El Rey. The, the whole point was to have it on Go90. Like we thought it would be out for free for the world to see and we could market ourselves and whatever. Go90 went out of business. And that never happened. So then it was like, well, what's going to happen? Where does this go? So I went and just made bootlegs of my own damn movie. And I just made DVDs. I put an audio commentary with Daniel and I on it, some behind the scenes that I made out of footage that I had filmed. And you were selling them at the cons. And I was just selling bootlegs of my own movie at the cons. Well, at first it was very like, People who were interested in the movie, I was like, hey, man, I, I got, I, I'm selling it here if you want it because I didn't know what was going to happen. I went to Galaxy Con this last week. Uh, it's a Minneapolis Minneapolis Con, and I just I put them out on the table because now I have the rights back and I can sell it however I want. So I'm like, I made a hundred of these bootlegs. If anyone wants to buy it, this is your one chance to buy this version of the movie. I'm I'm going back and I'm cleaning it up now that I have the rights, and I'm going to put it out on you know the DVD, stuff you talked Blu-ray, about, the, VHS. The, I, I'll do. I am. I'm doing. You VHS gotta do the VHS, dude. I am doing you gotta do the VHS. And, and, you know, with Film Hub and with, you know, we talked to Indie Film Rights and Troma Now, and we've talked to all these people that you've sort of kind of put me in contact with, because I never would have heard of Indie Film Rights. I probably wouldn't have heard of Film Hub. I had worked with Distriver. We all know how that went. So now yeah, I'm that's, terrified uh, of anything. I, I haven't heard. What's going on? <laughs> So that's literally, that's the only person, that's the only group I'd ever worked with was Distroverse. So, and that was a pain in the ass to get the stuff that I had done with other companies now off of it. So you've helped me with that as well. Great, man. But so, you know, we've got Film Hub at our, at our disposal. We've got these other things. So everything's sort of, 
I don't want to say like you can see. I don't know when this episode's coming out, but I don't want to say you can see it on Amazon Prime yet because we're in QC processes and all this stuff, mm-hmm. and you never know when things are going to come out. But hopefully, very, very, very soon. Okay. Uh, and that the good exorcist is there, but I put this hundred copies of the DVD out on the table and it was like, anyone want to buy this thing? I made like, I had the rebel without a crew poster. Behind Dude, I saw me. it. I saw the pictures and I'm going to, I'm going to have you send that picture to me. I'm going to put it on the, uh, in the show notes. I want to put, I want people to see this. Dude, I sold out of a hundred copies. Of course you did. How much did you sell each for? Bottom. So I was selling them for just $10, which is a DVD. $10 is not, it's a lot, but it's not it's bad. A hundred, so you made a grand off that. I made a grand off of it. Well, and here's the thing. That's As awesome. people bought it, they ended up buying t-shirts. t-shirts. They ended up buying patches and stickers. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. They ended up tipping me. They were just like, $10 is too little, man. You should. This is a limited edition thing. You, you autographed it and I signed. The DVD was just like literally a white DVD, so I draw a little picture on it and sign it and stuff like that for everyone. So they'd give me a little extra. I, I ended up making a little bit of money that I didn't spend anything on the movie. Like it, The movie is a $7,000 movie out of Robert's pocket, not mine. So yes, I but, he's monet- but he's already monetized it uh, enough I'll- through – yeah, of oh, course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he's already monetized it. He, Robert's not in the business of holding down the five $7,000 films and locking them up in distribution hell. I don't think that's really what he's about. Um, so I, I was assuming at one point or another those rights – I mean I understood it. there was probably a windowing. It had to be on air and they still probably own it for life to be able to be broadcast, um, yep. which makes fine. perfect sense. But if you can exploit the but other – it was my student film. Of like course. The fact that I get to make money on my student film, anything. If I make 20 bucks, that's better than most students make I, on their student films. And so. I, want, I, want, I really want people to understand this because this is what I'm preaching in my new book, The, the Rise of the Film Entrepreneur. I, I, I'm really preaching. You're, you are – everything you just said is a film entrepreneur method without question. You identified your niche. You've made the product for a low, a low money. You're actually leveraging – press and attention that you would have not gotten in a normal $7,000 movie. So you're still, right. you're leveraging that you've created multiple ancillary product lines that you can sell at these places. And now you're actually exploiting the rights to that film and exploiting that product in other multiple avenues that are non-exclusive. So you can continue to spread those revenue streams, hopefully passive revenue streams that you'll keep coming in for years to come. Is that a fair statement that covers everything? It is 100% a fair statement. And on top of that, because I've done all non-exclusives, after you know a year here and a year there and whatever, I get to go back to it and see where it's at. So it's the long game of like, well, if The Good Exorcist builds an audience, great. But I can always just keep going with this sort of self-distribution or with these little non-exclusives that will help me get more and more eyes on it throughout the years. So – that's the beauty of this movie is – and I still retain the rights to sequels. I still retain the rights to do an animated Mer- series. Merch. I plan- merch, lunchboxes. Merch huge. Dude, I'm literally doing a lunchbox. Of course you are. I'm I, literally doing dude, a lunchbox. In my, I'm dude, so excited. Dude, in my book, I talk all about the horror niche because it's such a, a lucrative niche – for for independent filmmakers and and they love physical media they love merch and if you love what you're doing i mean they can smell a money grab so don't try to do that but so you really do need to love what you're doing but if you do that is an audience that can sustain you if you want to put the work in if you want to go and hustle the cons and also build up a brand and do all you you can make a living at it and you could actually i was gonna ask you like you have three movies two movies now you're making your third now so in three or four years you might have four or five six of these movies that were done at a very low budget that you controlled 110 percent you have complete creative control and now you have multiple revenue streams coming in from all of these so every time you go to a con all of a sudden you don't have one movie you have multiple movies and multiple merchandise right. thing. then of course you could be selling this online you could be doing other different ways to create more and i'm assuming there should be an online course somewhere coming online where you're teaching people how to do all these things because you now you've established yourself <laughs> as an expert or, or, or thought leader in this space based in the horror horror movie space and show them how you're doing it so that's another revenue stream you can create all of this well, stuff but you're not look the thing is i'm trying to make a point here is that 
you're not going to become a millionaire right now off this. You might. That's so great. But you're doing what you love to do. You're putting food on the table, your roof over your head, and you get to be an artist to do whatever the hell you want while you're still providing a service to an audience. And that, to me, is the dream. Sure, Robert does that on a much larger scale than both you and I put together. But that's okay. It doesn't have to. We all don't have to be multimillionaires working in that sandbox. We can work at smaller sandboxes. My sandbox is different than your sandbox. You know, we all are creating different worlds for ourselves and the tools are around today that we can do that. So I, first of all, I applaud you, sir. I applaud Thank you. Golf, a golf clap, sir, a golf clap. <laughs> I love the golf clap. Yeah, and I mean, and with animation and stuff like that, I've also yeah. found out that, with, you know, with one of the things that I use these movies to do is build up, number one, my skills as a director to learn, like, I put myself in the movie, in the second movie, because I wanted to learn what it's like to, you know, be covered in fake blood or wear a mask or have that process done. So when I'm asking a actress or actor to do that, it's not weird for me. I lived through the process and I get it. So I'm trying to build myself as a director, but then also finding like I've gotten good at visual effects. I've done visual effects on Robert's movies. I've done visual effects on trauma movies. Now I've done visual effects on all sorts of movies coming in. And uh, you've talked about Jeremy Wanick before a few times, right? Yeah, Jeremy, Jeremy Wanick is, has like, he has been a total inspiration to me in as much as dude is one of the hardest working people you'll ever meet in your life. He is so hardworking and we worked at a full-time job together for like 10 years. So we've been, we worked together forever. we both just branched off from that to start our own businesses. And I literally had lunch with him this morning and nice. we talked about the movies I'm working on. And we talked about some of the things I'm doing with Troma and Full Moon Features and all of these other kind of like B movie companies. Is Full Moon still I'm, around? Is Full Moon still yeah, around? I'm literally working with Full Moon this Tuesday. So or next Tuesday. On what pu- yeah, on, pu- so, on Puppet Master seventy five? Which one are you working? <laughs> Dude, they're they're doing a Puppet Master of movie. They're doing they this are. thing called the Dead they're doing this thing called the Deadly Ten where they're showing the behind the scenes of ten feature films being made. So there's all these feature films being made and they're like live streaming the process. And I think it's deadly ten dot com or something like that. And I'm going to be filming the behind the scenes for one of these movies. That's and awesome. I just because I love doing behind the scenes stuff. And because of Rebel Without a Crew, I've kind of worked on the reality stuff. So, uh, but I learned from these small companies, like these B movie companies. And they're kind of like where my mind is going as well because they've done the, they did the Empire thing that got them into making a whole bunch of crappy movies at the time in the 90s. They built this thing, this empire of it, and they're still able to do it today and make a ton of money off of it because of you know building all of building this empire in their own way in their time um anyway like, long like, story tra- short, like trauma from, like robert like all yeah. these guys and I, I, talking to jeremy i we he taught me sort of this work ethic and we were talking about how visual effects has been able to way been a way for us to both build our brands and build our companies and i've used animation visual effects and just learned over the last 10 years and now, yeah, now I'm getting to the point where I can direct my own movies and tell my own stories. And in five years, who knows where I'll be as long as you don't rest too long. Take breaks, meditate, figure out how you can survive on getting, you know, kicking ass and hustling. But you need to find your way to do it that specifically works that doesn't let you be lazy and lets you continue to just kick ass and work hard. Yeah, and and just so everybody knows, Jeremy worked on both This Is Meg and on on the Corner of Ego and Desire, doing visual effects for me. He's a a great a great guy and did some amazing work on both those films for me. And he just reached out to me. He, like he was just like originally was like, hey man, if you ever need any help, let me know. And I'm like, well, I you know what, I need something. And uh, calling yeah. back to the beginning of this episode where I said I just reached out to Kevin Smith and was like, hey man, I did this animation. I like you know I like your stuff. If you ever need animation, I'm around. The same thing. Jeremy does that with people as well. Part of it is just being in the right place at the right time and not afraid to say that your services are available and proving that you have services that they're going to want. Yeah. And you also, and you've also not been able to, and you did, I did this too for a long time, obviously most of my career where I was able to build a post-production company to be able to sustain my filmmaking habit. Uh, So it's kind of like you've, and that's how, and by building that company up, I was able to put a lot of tools in my toolbox that allows me to make a $5,000 movie or a $3,000 movie because I've, I've had all that education and experience over the years and you've done the same thing. So you're, if you're not making a movie or not making your money off movies, you are making 
off, you're making money off the filmmaking process in one way, shape or form. And you're learning every day. That's the biggest thing is you got to take, you know, when you get that job in where you're like, oh, I do not want to work on this project, but you need it. You need to take it to pay the bills. Don't think about it like that. Take it in and be like, well, what can I what can I actually learn from this? What's something that's in this process that is going to help me in the future? Because you're going to have to take in a lot of jobs that you probably don't want to take. It's just a fact like that's that's <laughs> that's. <laughs> being a filmmaker that's part of the life is you're gonna have to do stuff that you don't want to do and use that to make the stuff that you do want to do oh so sweet mm-hmm. oh it's so much better the the days like today in for this movie scumbag i'm doing i'm turning my whole basement into a it's about a guy who's trapped in a basement during a mutant apocalypse it's my omega man and so it's it's me in a gas mask the whole movie folks it is going to be a weird movie we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor And now back to the show. And there are mutants that I play and there are stop motion monsters and hand monsters and all sorts of weird stuff. And it's $250,000, right? That's how much it is in the class. Yeah. It's like, well, no, we're, we're like, oh, we went over and we're at like one, we're just one, under 1.5 1. 1. 1. mil. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a, that's a, we laugh, but that is a lesson that everyone needs to understand that movie you just pitched me. There is a budget threshold that makes sense if you're paying for it yourself because there's a limited audience for that film. I'm not saying it can't blow up and turn into Napoleon Dynamite or a big, huge monster hit. Sure, everyone could win a lottery. But the point is, this is a small film that's experimental. I look, I shot 100% a hundred percent. I shot a movie at the Sundance Film Festival. You know, that's it's, experimental. It's my version of Ego and Desire, man. When I saw Ego, I was just like, <laughs> okay, what? How can I do this for my audience that I built? And push myself to the limit. And the limit, I realized, is every time I said Rebel Without a Crew, every time I say that that thing, Rebel Without a Crew, it feels tainted because your your cast is your crew. Your friends become your crew. And my, my friends are better than any crew I've ever worked with. I've worked on some relatively big projects, you know, especially corporate stuff where you're like, how the, how the hell do they get a budget for this, this big for a best buy commercial you're just like oh my god this is my next seven movies in this budget and the Mm -hmm. crew is massive and so working with my friends they become a better crew than any of those productions they're just amazing so my only real way of making a movie without a crew is to get rid of everyone i just have to work by myself and i know that i'm not gonna have a a big i'm I'm not gonna have an audience like a star wars would have that's just not gonna happen but what i will have are filmmakers who are interested in the process people who are going into it going like he net there's no way he accomplished something he couldn't do it the naysayers the people who just want to see a fun weird little no budget horror movie and people who know who you are and want to follow you and people who see the trailer and go oh that looks cool because in the end i hope that the movie is able to just be watched on its own. I want to make something that if you don't know what you're going into, you'll watch the trailer and you'll be like, oh, this looks interesting. I'll check it out. So if I can get to a con and get the trailer in front of people and sell it to them, I'm going to make money off of it. Yesterday I was at Home Depot. What I assume Home Depot is all around the U.S., but I don't know. Yes, it is. is. I was at a Home Depot and I was like, oh man, I'm, 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 my basement has like this little window at the top that I wanted it to look like it got, you know, uh, metal sheet metal over the top with wood planks. Like he's locked himself in. And I was looking at this sheet metal. I'm just like, Oh man, $12. Oh, like that's, I'm keeping this budget as low as I can. Like, I just want it to be nothing. And I spent, you know, a few bucks on sliders that are on their, their, uh, timed sliders. Mm-hmm. You know, they're like, I think they're like 400. I think I spent 400 bucks. Yeah. Through you your stuff. iPhone, you can use the iPhone to connect it. Exactly. Right? That's the kind I got the iPhone kind. And so, you know, I spent when all this, when, as I'm going, I've spent maybe a thousand dollars on new stuff, which then I can use on my next movie. So it's justifiable in that way. And if this movie ends up being a $3,000 movie, great. Like I can make $3,000 back on this idea, but it's, it's a matter of getting out there and getting that $3,000 back. And then after that, finding a bigger way to, you know, more money to make. 
But with that being said, it's also a tax write-off because it's my movie for my company. It's a passion project. I could go on vacation for 3000 bucks, or I could do this. And you can this invest is- in something that can generate revenue for you moving forward. I- and once you build out these systems, though, once you build out these systems of like, I can go to the cons, I can set up on, you know, my website, I can set up an email list to get in and just, it, it's, it, 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 you can build a business. This is, you're building a business. You're building exactly. a business around your art, around your films. And that's what we all should strive for is to do that. I mean, look, again, I'll bring Robert back up. Robert built a business off of his art. It's a massive business. And he was, many, many ways, he was at the right place at the right time in, 90, in the 90s when El Mariachi showed up. When the opportunity for El Rey Network showed up, he was at the right place at the right time and had the right, you know, it was, it, everything fell into place. But he's been able to leverage those great opportunities and his great talent um, and business savvy to be able to build an entire business around what he does and also helps other filmmakers do the same thing through his, uh, through Troublemaker. He also doesn't say no. Like that's the beautiful thing about Robert is when an idea pops up or when something comes to be, he, his reaction is just do it. And I learned that from him when I would ask him questions and I'd be like, do you think I could? And he's like, yeah, you could. If you think you can, you can. You just thought up the idea and I'll make it happen. Like stop questioning it, just do it. And that is the Robert mentality is like someone could go, man, should I make a, PG spy kids movie after I've made Desperado and all of this other stuff. And Robert, he easily could have said no to spy kids. It's, I, I still think it's his highest grossing film. I oh, think no, 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 spy no. Kids- the, 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 again, being a Robert Rodriguez, uh, uh, you know, uh, Robert file, uh, he, his empire was built on the back of spy kids. Yeah. 100%. I mean, that, that's what built troublemaker. That's what built the studios, all of it. It wasn't, you know, later on, Sin City showed up, but it was Spy Kids yeah. that it exploded him into a stratosphere. And Spy Kids 3D was massive. People don't remember Huge. that that was Huge. like the first 3D project. That was the first thing shot on those 3D cameras because essentially they gave him the technology to just mess around with. And he just had a blast with it. He still loved it. Like when you talk to him about Spy Kids, his eyes light up they're so much fun there's so much my kids have seen all the spy kids they love them and they're so powerful um and they're uh, they made he made so much money spy kids or i think it's spy kids one or spy kids three is his highest grossing film i I don't know maybe maybe alita um alita might have i don't know i'm not sure if, if alita passed it up but as far as like grossing like return on investment oh no no roi roi is spy kids yeah. I mean, he, he made the first one for 30 million if i'm not mistaken it was like 20 some million or 27 million something along those lines and it grossed just domestically like 140 or 150 million but then the merchandising as as uh, mel brooks says in Spaceballs, merchandising it was it, so much the tie-ins with mcdonald's the time i mean it was yeah. sh- so much money so So, much money (laughs) i know we got to wrap up but i got to tell one quick story yeah man go ahead so rebel without a crew i we we were like doing between the making our movie the reality show stuff everything that happened we were just like working 22 hour days like we weren't sleeping it was just so much and i was trying to edit my movie as we went as well Mm -hmm. So it was just like crazy stressful. And after we wrapped, we had this Sunday where they put us up in a hotel and they were like, shut your brains off, like do nothing. And I had bronchitis. I was dying. There was a moment on the show where uh, Robert like gives me the fist bump because I got sick two days before the movie was supposed before we were supposed to wrap The Good Exorcist. And I quit. They didn't show this on the show. I quit. I I called my wife and I'm like, I'm done. I can't do this. I was like, I hawked up blood in the shower and I was just like, I'm done. I am done. I I am sick. I can't move. I I cannot finish this movie. And I had scheduled all of the fun stuff, all of the bloody stuff in the movie, all of the stuff that makes a movie mine in the last two days. Because I'm like, well, we'll get through all of the story. And then in the last two days, we're just going to spray gallons of blood. We're just going to go for it. And I was so sick. I didn't want to do any of that. So I was dying. And they put us up in this hotel on a Sunday. And I walked into the hotel and I just like crashed on the bed and they brought us food. They brought us P. Terry's, which is the best burger I've ever eaten in my entire life. P. Terry's in Austin, Texas. Get it. They're not I'm not uh, I'm not getting any 
money back from them for saying this. Sure, I just sure, love sure. music be there. He's, and they brought it to the door and I sat down, and I laid down in the bed and I'm like, I, I think I cried. I honestly think I laid in the bed and I just like with tears, you know, that cry when you're so tired that it's just like tears just sort of like rolling down my face. I just laid there looking up at the ceiling, feeling miserable. And I, I got the strength to grab my P Terry's and turn on the TV. And I am not joking. I, this isn't, 100 percent swear to god i turned on the tv spy kids was on i just turned it on and spy kids popped on i didn't move i set down the remote and i watched spy kids and ap terry's in my underwear nice a great image by the way it's fantastic is it image. that it's just oh i, I looked <laughs> i probably i was the skinniest i've ever been and i'm a skin guy to begin with because i've been working so hard i hadn't eaten because i was so stressed i hadn't sure, been eating sure. i just laid in that bed in my underwear and went like the film gods are smiling down at me with spy kids right now. And I just I laid in bed and watched it and felt like a child, like 100% like a kid on a Saturday morning in my undies eating food that I like. Like it's like the equivalent of my bowl of cereal and just watch spy kids. It was amazing. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. That's that's awesome, and then I'm assuming you finished. Oh, I did. I watched the whole thing. I didn't. No, no, you I finished. Put, you finished the show. Oh yeah, I did finish. <laughs> yeah, this was this was after we had wrapped and everything. Actually, honestly, the the second we wrapped the movie or the the Rebel Without a Crew, uh, the Good Exorcist, I walked into the front door of the mansion that they had put us up in, and one of the producers was like, "What's wrong with him?" And everyone was like, "He's been like this for two days." She had been on a music video shoot and came back and she was like, he needs to go to the hospital. You guys, this isn't Josh. This isn't the guy that we had on the show. My face was green. My skin was nasty. I was just like, Bleh. and she took me to the hospital. So and I literally wrapped my movie and instead of like celebrating, I went to the hospital. <laughs> as a true indie filmmaker, sir. Um, I finished it and you guys can see The Good Exorcist. I don't know when this episode is coming up, but it will be on Amazon Prime soon. It will be on uh trauma now it'll it's on itunes but it's kind of a different version that l ray network put out um it'll be if if you want to you could subscribe to my patreon i run a patreon where i show yeah. it's it's my, my like i like the patreon because i loved the behind the scenes on dvds back in the day like yeah. remember kevin smith put out that jay and silent bob strike back like three disc edition that was just filled with fun behind the scenes stuff that's what my patreon is it's my like second dvd for everything i post behind the scenes for everything um and i just constantly am making new stuff when i see something that i'm like oh i never posted this or someone asks me like how did you blow up the teddy bear in the good exorcist or kill the teddy bear i just make a behind the scenes on like how nice. i did it and i talk about it so you can subscribe to my patreon right now anytime that this is coming out and you will get the good exorcist sent to you immediately a screener of it that's awesome, dude. Now, I did, before I end the show, man, I wanted to ask you one question. You brought this up in our pre pre uh, show interview, if you will. Your attitude change. Um, I felt that that was extremely important for you to talk about. How did uh, you know your attitude change from being the angry, bitter, negative filmmaker, which we all, like I always say, we all know an angry, bitter filmmaker, and if you don't know one, you are the angry and bitter filmmaker. Um, how your attitude change has affected not only your life, but your career and, and everything you're trying to do. Yeah. So I, I was the pessimist. Like I was the negative guy. And my wife still says I'm the pessimist because I am the guy who, you know, when I walk out the door, I'm thinking about what we didn't bring or what could go wrong or what, like it's, there's like a, it's a skill. It's a skill. Yeah, there's a, there's a pessimistic attitude in me. That's not looking at what positive could happen. Hey, we're going to have fun on this vacation. I'm like, what did we forget? And but I was that to the ultimate degree. I used to look at stuff and I would get a job and I would instantly just be like, oh, God, I got to do this work or I this is not going to be fun or no one's ever going to like what I make or I'm always going to be a failure. And like just everything was pessimistic. Everything was pessimistic. And three years ago, so I'm I'm 34 now. So it was four years ago at this point. You know, I kind of just turned 34, though. So it was basically when I turned 31. So it was like three years ago, more or less. Um, 
in my 30s, I, or my whole life, I had one thing on my bucket list, make a feature film. That was literally the only thing I ever wanted to do with my life. I didn't care about anything else. And I had kids. I own a house. I have all of this stuff that is stuff that people would consider positive things. But I never finished my feature film. And it, like, always dragged me down. And this was, like, a few weeks be- before I turned 31 and I'm, or before I turned 30. And I turned 30 and I'm like, okay, I'm going to make a feature film. That's the only thing I'm going to do. And I turned 31 and I was like, dude, you're never going to do it. Like if you don't just think positive, change your mindset and go, let's go make a movie. Let's have fun with it. Let's do this thing. You're always going to look at things negatively. And Daniel, me, Keith and Strauss went out in the woods and something flipped in my brain where I'm like, we can have fun doing this and you can be happy about every project you bring in and you can think positively about stuff. These last three years have been the best three years of my life. Waking up in the morning and the first thing, it's its a challenge for me. I have to wake up in the morning and not go, what's going to go wrong today? I have to literally think to myself in the shower, this is going to be a good day. Let's do this thing. I'm like that little girl who's like, you are good. You are great. This is going to be a positive day. That's me every day. And I have to think positive. Every day is amazing now. Now, I have my bad days just like everyone else, but at the end of the day, when the bad day ends and I lay down in bed, I'm like, yeah, but you made it through it. And actually, you know what? You finished this animation. You did a podcast. You, you know, even if even if it's something small, like you relaxed today, you had a bad day. Now tomorrow gets to be the good one because you got the bad one out of the way. Like that thinking positive has made my business flourish. It's made my films flourish. It's made everything I do feel like it's all kind of worth it. And it's about thinking that way, being positive and not going, all right, this is going to be a crappy project or today's going to be a bad day on set. Oh, that guy showed up late on Rebel Without a Crew. Like there was one day where one of the cast members was like, hey, man, I'm my son came into town a day early and I'm not going to be able to show up to set today. I wasn't paying them much, so it, I couldn't be like, no, you are going to show up to set. Instead, I just went, OK, we're going to write around him today. And then when he's here tomorrow, we'll just film him up against the wall in the corner. And it's like he's angrily standing in the corner. Totally fine and totally worked. And no one ever has noticed it in the movie that he wasn't on set that day because mm-hmm. I found a workaround. And you could I have lost and you, and you could have lost your ever. You could have lost your mind and ruined your entire day and, and ruined the shoot that day. If my attitude had changed based on him not showing up, it would have been a terrible day. So I told the story about how I called my wife and I was like, I'm not filming. I'm not like that was the day that pessimistic, angry Josh showed up. And Daniel said, Daniel, I called Daniel and he said, actually, I talked to one of my PAs on from the reality crew. And he was like, all you need to do is get to Daniel and you'll change your attitude. And I was like, yeah, Daniel can't show up for another two hours and I'm going I'm leaving. You guys can't like I, there's no way he's like, well, what would make you have what like what could you do? Like what would turn your, your attitude around? He's like, I see that you don't want to be here. What would change your attitude? And I'm like, you know what? I want to go to the Halloween store. And this was the day after Halloween. So it was like the 90 percent off day. So I went to the Halloween store and I just bought like six gallons of blood and just walked out of there with like 90 percent off gallons of blood. And I'm like, all right, today is going to be an OK day. And I just found that thing to turn it around. And then I got to set and Daniel was there and he was like, all right, uh, you want me to roll around on the phone with it or on the floor with a telephone? And I was like, oh, that sounds like fun. Yeah, I guess I'll stay. Let's do that. And that's when we filmed the scene where Daniel rolls around on the floor with a telephone. (laughs) That's awesome, dude. That's awesome. Well, it's all about it's all about that positivity, man. I think there's so many people who don't make anything because they think about what bad could come from it or Mm -hmm. the fact that someone's not going to like it or the fact that. You know, it maybe didn't turn out the way they wanted it to or whatever. Yeah, get rid of that. Man, that's, you just got to go. You just got to go. That's going to hold you back every day of your life. Think about the one person who's going to like it. Think about the the fact that you finished something that no one else will ever finish. Think about the right. fact that, you know, tomorrow's another day and you never know what's going to happen. So keep pushing forward. Fantastic advice, sir. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my yeah. guests, what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Just start right now. Start. Like right now, you you are sitting here thinking as a young filmmaker, you're going like, how can I break into the business? You're never going to break into the business if you're sitting there thinking. Stop thinking and go make a cartoon or go shoot something in your backyard. No one has to see it. Just go do it right now and show it to your friends. Show it to your uh, significant other. 
like so many people that's i talked to i, I did a high school uh like a q a at a high school for this like film all these film students or all these students made films that they showed on the big screen and this uh one girl asked like almost this exact question and she was like now that i made my short film i don't know what to do next because i don't think i can do a feature or i don't think i can i was just like why like i'm no better than you are like I, you've got if you can get a camera from your school that's better than the camera i had at the time filming this like you have equipment i know that schools have them like just go do it and if film school is your route go for it like that's great if you feel like you'll learn more in film school totally go for it if you feel like you'll learn more just going out and making a feature film go do that do what you feel is right for you i wasted years because i tried to listen to what people told me i should do you know i asked my dad every day or i'd ask other people who have no idea how to get into the film industry they know how to do something else. That was the worst advice I could. The worst advice to myself I could give is listen to other people because mm -hmm. it didn't work for me. What worked for me is the day I got up and I just went, "Screw it! You and your buddies are going in the woods and we're making a movie." Good for you, man. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Um, be positive. That was the hardest part. I mean, I like looking back at my twenties, I can't believe how angry I was about everything. I bought a house. <laughs> I had kids. I did all this amazing stuff that, you know, is very cool. I worked with Kevin Smith. It, the irony being I was working with Kevin Smith and I would sit there and go like, Kevin isn't going to like this. And he liked everything I did, except for one animation he thought was too dark, which I find now I look back, I'm like, that's so funny that I was mm -hmm. too dark. <laughs> I think that's amazing. Uh, and I just had to change a few things and then he was kind of cool with it. But I just I like bloody, gory stuff. And Kevin didn't like bloody, gory stuff. So we found a happy workaround for it. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. But yeah, mine, my, the thing that took me the longest to learn was just be positive, like stop worrying about what other people think and be self-aware of what you think of yourself. Like you've got to look, take, take yourself outside of your body and just look at like, would you be proud of you or would, what would you do? What would you tell yourself? I saw this, there's this meme going around that's like, um, be the, be the person how ah, fuck i mean i totally am screwing it up but it's like be the person to your to to others that you would have wanted, wanted to be, to be. Yeah, what like that, i'm yeah. screwing it up i know i understand what you're saying and but i think that same thing goes for yourself now think about yourself in the future and what that future self would say to you at this moment mm -hmm. like if you are the if you can get to the place that you want to be like 10 years from now i hope to have five films done, five features done that I can have on a table, little, little mini empire. Now I'm, I'm shooting realistic and small with that. I think, I think I can do more than that in 10 sure. years, but what would that guy say to me now? And he would say, go make scumbag, go make that movie that you're going to make by yourself in your basement. Don't be afraid to do that because every day I wake up and I'm like, I can't do this. This is how am I going to, how do you keep things in focus? How am I going to get good audio? How am I going to do this with a gas mask on? But that guy would say, go do it. I know he would. Like, because I wish I could tell myself 10 years ago to go do that movie right now. Oh, God, I would have said that so many times. Jesus, I wasted 20 years waiting to make my first feature because I was an idiot. Um, but anyway, that's another story for another day. Uh, three of your favorite films of all time, sir. Well, I'm going to go with American Movie. Have you seen that documentary, American it's Movie? Current, it's one of the greatest um, filmmaking movies of all time. I, I seriously put it on in the background while I'm working, and I get so inspired by, by Mark Brochard. Now, I know he's they're playing it up like this dude is kind of, you know, goofy Mark Brochard. He's talking about all this crazy stuff, and he's, you know, frantic, and, you know, he can't finish his feature film and makes a short film instead. But I watch it, and I'm just like, this guy is the most passionate dude I've ever seen. He wakes up every day thinking about filmmaking. He can't get his feature going, so he goes back and makes his short film and finishes it and gets it seen. How many people would have just let that short film die? I mean, it's not even that short. It's like a 30-minute 
short film. And like he could have easily just been like, I can't finish this. And he's working on 16 millimeter, which instantly I'm just like, oh my God, I can't imagine working on 16 millimeter like that in your basement, in your house, going to the, the school. Like, I love that movie. Yeah, it's like, that, it's, that, like it's like, it's like uh, watching Ed Wood. Like when you watch Ed Wood, people are like, oh, he's it, crazy. I'm like, no, it, it, it brings a tear to my eye every time I see it. <laughs> oh, he, it's exactly that. It's like a, it's a documentary being able to see that kind of mentality. I love it. So American movies, my number one, uh, number two, I'm going to have to go with the shining. The shining oh, got me so some, good. some hard times. Like I, when I was in that pessimistic mood and you should turn the shining would, on to, to, to rise your spirits, sir. I would, I would turn it on. Cause I'd be like, well, at least I'm not <laughs> as crazy as Jack Torrance. Like, wow. I, I, I was working like 50 hour weeks and yeah. then coming home and animating for Kevin Smith which was also taking me like 40 hours. So I was working like 90 hour weeks. I was so tired. I wasn't sleeping. I was losing my mind and I wasn't able to work on any of my own stuff. So while I would work on Kevin's, the animation for, for Smotimation or for Tusk, I would put on the shining and I would put on the shining in the background and just feel like, okay, just don't go full Jack Torrance. You can make it. And it really helped me a lot. Um, All right. And, and third and the thing, the thing is yeah. just it's, it's just perfect. a masterpiece it's it's horror it's fun to watch the characters are amazing it it's just a, oh, gorgeously amazing i love it and where can I people find not putting beetlejuice on that list beetlejuice right. is is my fourth i gotta just shout it out beetlejuice i had i had the guy who wrote beetlejuice on um a while ago and it was great to hear the whole how that did you hear that episode i don't think i have you got you can't gotta, believe i've missed it you go to it's in bulletproof screenwriting, so it okay. just sits there, and he just talks about how it came, just how it came along, and and the whole the whole concept, how it was originally going to be something else, and then Tim Burton showed yeah. up, and it was just oh, it's a great, it's a great, great episode. I can't believe I missed this. It's yeah. crazy. <laughs> and uh, where can people find you and uh, your wares, sir? Yeah, so um, I'm right now in the process of updating my website because uh, FlushStudios.com is basically just two trailers right now. But uh, you can find me on all the social medias. I love social media. I'm a total – I'm addicted to I it. See that. And I, don't I even, see that. I don't, even, I don't even feel bad about it. I love it because I love talking to people. So being able to like get on social media and chat with people and, and use it as like the modern – like the old Greek forums. I love that idea of the forum – and each social media has its own little way of being that. So I'm on Twitter, uh, at Josh Stifter. I'm on Facebook. It's just me. Come find me. Um, and there's a Flush Studios Facebook. Instagram is at Flush Studios. Uh, you can find The Good Exorcist on FatherGill.com. Greywood's Plot is out and about hitting up festivals and stuff like that. I'm going to have a panel at this is a long ways out, but I'll be at South by Southwest. I just found out today doing a panel for Rebel Without a Crew and some other fun stuff. And I'm all over the place. I Yeah, and uh, my podcast is the Flush Studios podcast. Um, I also have a podcast called The Escalator Pitch that I do with John Brennan from Troma. And yeah, all over. That's awesome, dude. Josh, man, thank you so much for coming on, brother. I, I truly wow. appreciate it, man. It, you're an inspiration, sir. To, uh, to many indie filmmakers out there, myself included. So thank you so much, my friend. Dude, thank you for everything. Like I said earlier, you have been a, a guru to me over the past few months. Though probably the reason why I missed that Beetlejuice episode is because I'm too busy listening to all your episodes with indie filmmakers where I'm learning so much. I, <laughs> it's so awesome being able to learn this part of the process that they don't teach in film school. They don't teach anywhere. The film entrepreneur stuff just helps me like all of the distribution stuff has been amazing so thank you sir i want to thank josh for coming on and inspiring the tribe and dropping those knowledge bombs thank you so much josh if you want to get links to anything that we spoke about in this episode including the link to watch the good exorcist on indie film hustle tv just head over to the show notes at indiefilmhustle.com forward slash three seven five now, really quickly, guys, I know a lot of you have seen On the Corner of Ego and Desire, and I've gotten a lot of great response on it. If you happen to have watched it on Amazon or have watched it somewhere else, but can you just please go to Amazon and leave a review and also head over to IMDb 
and leave a review there. Not even a review, but just like give us 10 stars or nine stars or whatever you like, but give us a review. It does help us out with the algorithm and helps get the movie seen by more and more people. So to leave a review for Amazon, just head over to egoanddesirefilm.com, click on Amazon and leave the review. I really, really appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much for listening. 375 episodes. That is insane. I cannot wait for episode 400, which is just around the corner. Thank you guys so much for making this possible. Thank you so much for listening and spreading the word about what we do at Indie Film Hustle. I truly, truly, truly appreciate everything you guys do and the tribe does for me and for what we're trying to do, the mission that we're trying to have here and help as many filmmakers as humanly possible. Thanks again, guys. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.